Dell actually sent over their premium luxury cooler that they show on all of the advertising. Isn't she a beauty? Now, to be fair, it wasn't actually through customer support that I got my hands on this cooler. A Dell representative reached out and they said that they're willing to loan me one of these to see if it makes any difference. And they made it very clear that unless you specifically spec up a K SKU variant in a Dell XPS, you're not allowed to have one of these. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to compare this Dell premium luxury cooler to this, which is a Noctua NHU9S, a cooler that I've been reassured by people in the first Dell XPS video will work on a Dell XPS because they've got weird proprietary mounting hardware. But before we get into that, it's time for a word from today's video sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare, which is an online learning community with thousands of classes for you to get better at stuff. It's a great place to discover new skills in various topics like animation, design, illustration, lifestyle, business, and writing. In terms of animation, for example, there's a course by Fraser Davidson called Simple Character Animation Create a Walk Cycle with Dog. Fraser Davidson walks you through a simple process to create characterful animations. Look at all the life and character and dem animations. Classes on Skillshare also involve a class project which helps you flex on everybody around you at how much more you've learned than them. Skillshare is also affordable at less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, which means that you can brush up on all of these new skills without breaking the bank. So if this sounds good to you and you're ready to go from a skillless loser to a skillful winner, then use the link in my description below. The first thousand people to use the link will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Now aside from the coolers, we're going to do another test today because for some reason on every video where I complain about single channel versus dual channel, I get a bunch of comments of people telling me that it doesn't matter. There's no performance difference between the two. So for the 17 millionth time on this channel, Channel, we're going to show that it does in fact make a difference going from single channel to dual channel. Now to the credit of Dell's customer support, they did actually end up clearing that $330 coupon that we needed for the dual channel 16 gig RAM kit, which I still can't get over that RAM pricing. But then a bit of a whoopsie happened uh, because Anna ordered the RAM and then accidentally ordered laptop RAM. So we don't have Dell RAM to test in dual channel versus the single channel Dell kit. Uh, but I do have a Patriot Viper kit that clocks to 2666 megahertz in dual channel on this system compared to the 2933 megahertz of the single stick. So we're going to compare it like a slightly kneecapped dual channel against single channel with an advantage. Having a quick look at the benchmarks comparing the faster single stick to the slower dual channel kit, uh, we're getting about a 10 to 20% performance uplift depending on the use case. So with Battlefield 5, it's a big jump going from 106 frames per second to 132 frames per second uh, with higher 1% lows as well. GTA 5 wasn't as much a difference with 115 to 130 frames per second. However, when it comes to Cinebench, which is a purely CPU based workload, a very short burst test, uh, there was pretty much no difference. It was within the margin of error. But that's not because there's no difference between single and dual channel there. It's because the CPU immediately jumped to 100 degrees Celsius and then throttled itself into oblivion. So <laughs> whether or not you have eight channels of RAM going there, it's not going to make a difference because the CPU is on fire. Uh, so with that, it brings us neatly to the cooler comparisons. Now, when it comes to the temperature testing, we're going to have a look at Battlefield 5 at 1080p because it very evenly stresses the system, both the CPU and the GPU. So it gives you a good indication of load temperatures while gaming. Uh, now, with the little stock loser cooler, it was fluctuating between 87 degrees and 93 degrees Celsius with a core frequency of 3.9 gigahertz. Now, the reason that 90 degrees Celsius is important is because that's when the CPU really starts slowing itself down. Uh, interestingly enough, though, having a chat with that Dell representative. According to Dell, they only consider it overheating if a system actually crashes under the thermal load to stop itself from catching on fire. 
Now, I guess that's not technically incorrect, but that tells you a lot about their kind of design philosophy around cooling solutions in their systems. Uh, now, moving over to the premium luxury cooler, it's, it's a lot better, actually. We were sitting at between 74 and 78 degrees Celsius with a core frequency of between 4.1 and 4.3 gigahertz. So we get a little bit more CPU frequency and we get way lower temperatures. It's still running pretty hot, but it's definitely better. As far as performance, differences go, it's not as big as single channel to dual channel. With Battlefield 5, we went from 132 frames per second to 136 frames per second, which, yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to notice that difference. Now, moving on to the Noctua cooler, it was fluctuating between 69 and 75 degrees Celsius, which is not much lower than the premium luxury cooler, but its core frequency was quite a bit higher. It was sitting between 4.5 and 4.6 gigahertz, and there was much less fluctuation going on because the temperatures were more under control. Although that didn't translate into any significant performance difference, uh, going from 136 frames per second with the premium luxury cooler to 140 frames per second with the Noctua cooler. And then finally, we get to the Cinebench results, which in my opinion are actually more important than the gaming tests because this isn't a gaming system and chances are people are gonna do extended CPU intensive workloads on this system. Uh, and Cinebench is actually not that hardcore. Like it's a two minute test that puts 100% load on the CPU. So if it can't handle Cinebench well, that doesn't bode well for extended workloads. Starting off with the little loser stock cooler. Um, yeah, the moment that you start the test, the CPU boosts to 4.3 gigahertz, but then immediately all the cores hit 100 degrees Celsius, and then it has to throttle back to 3.5 gigahertz until the end of the test. Uh, so basically, if you have a CPU intensive workload, if it's less than 10 seconds long, this cooler is really good, then you're golden. You're gonna get not quite the full performance of the CPU, but yeah, good, good. Uh, that actually leads to a result of 3,514 Cinebench points. Next up, we have the Ultra Premium Super Luxury Premium Dell Cooler, which with Cinebench starts off at about 4.6 gigahertz, but then after about 20 seconds, the CPU hits 90 degrees Celsius, and then it slows down to 3.9 gigahertz. That's a way better result than the first cooler, but there's still slowing down happening. Uh, and then the actual Cinebench result you get here is way better. It goes from 3,514 to 4,187. So that shows you how much that uh, thermal throttling is actually holding back the system. And then finally, when it comes to the little Noctua cooler, when starting the test, it also boosts straight up to 4.6 gigahertz. And then after 20 seconds, it also throttles down, but to about 4.2 gigahertz. Now, interestingly, uh, it's not seeming to run into the thermal limitations that the first two Dell coolers are, because the max CPU temperature that we're getting is about 80 degrees Celsius here. And then it gives you a score of 4,442, which is higher than the premium luxury cooler score. So it means we have a higher sustained clock. With the Noctua cooler, we're still seeing those CPU frequencies drop after 20 seconds, despite the fact that we're not actually running into any thermal limitations like we did with the two Dell coolers. Now, the reason for that is actually Intel's fault because of their turbo boost max short period boost max turbo mode thing, uh, which basically what that means is that the CPU is allowed to boost and use up to 225 watts of power for 20 seconds. And then after 20 seconds, regardless of thermally what's going on, it's gonna reduce the actual power allowance to the CPU, which means that you get a lower core frequency. Now, if you have like a normal custom PC motherboard from a company like Asus or Gigabyte or MSI or whatever, you don't really have to worry about those power limits because they usually just ignore them out of the box anyway. Whereas with this OEM system, they follow Intel's spec very carefully and well, they don't allow you to turn off that thing in the BIOS, which is unfortunate. And it means that your only option to bypass it is to download Intel's Extreme Tweaker Utility, which doesn't let you switch it off. It just lets you extend the boost period from 20 seconds to 120 seconds, uh, which is still not perfect, but it's better. And when you redo the Cinebench test with the Noctua cooler on there, the score jumps from 4,442 up to 4,612, which helps a little bit. It would have been higher if we could just turn that the, the boost limiter off, 
uh, but that's not an option on the Dell XPS, unfortunately. Now, the extended boost period wouldn't help the performance of the first two Dell coolers because they weren't throttling because of that. They were throttling because of thermal limitations. Just a final note before we get into the conclusion, the ambient temperature in this room while I did the test for all of the coolers was 19.5 degrees Celsius, and that mixed with a new thermal paste application for each of these coolers using the same thermal paste, and the fact that there was no dust buildup anywhere means that this is pretty much the best case scenario for the temperatures on this system. Two years down the line with some dust buildup in summer in a hotter country, and these results are gonna look way worse than they look here. I'm, I'm sorry, today's video was, was pretty boring. All we did was prove that bad CPU coolers are in fact bad and that single channel is worse than dual channel, something that we've done so many, so many times in this channel. But there we go, we have the results again. Now on a final note, in the beginning of the video, I told you I was gonna show you how to mount this Noctua cooler on the Dell XPS. The problem is, it turned into a more complicated process than I was expecting because of Dell's stupid proprietary cooler mounting that they have on here. It's really annoying actually. They give you bad CPU coolers that can't handle the CPU that it's screwed to, and then they weld the proprietary mounting to the case so that even if you wanted to, you couldn't upgrade the cooler yourself. Like, Dell, why do you do stuff like this? It's so irritating. But basically, what I ended up having to do was buy new screws that would screw into the mounting that Dell welded to the case for some reason. Uh, the problem was that the screws were too long. So I actually ended up having to dremel them down for them to fit into the mounting, uh, which for a beginner, using a dremel to cut screws down and stuff is maybe not a viable option. You could also dremel the standoffs off the case uh, but that would probably void your warranty. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine Dell would like you taking a Dremel to their case. And then there's the easier option, which is just buying one of the uber luxury, premium luxury coolers off of eBay, because uh, that's much easier. You just unscrew the stock cooler that's on there already, and then you screw on the luxury cooler with thermal paste in between and stuff. It's a really easy process that even a beginner can do. Uh, so yeah, I would recommend that for a beginner. And in my opinion, that's like a minimum upgrade on one of these. These systems. And then on a final, final note, Dell, stop using these terrible coolers on your non KSQ variant CPUs. It's an unacceptable cooling solution. And just because Acer does it with the loser Nitro Suck Face Edition doesn't mean you should do it too. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, like and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. Let me know in the comment section below what you think of the tests that we did today. And until next video, bye bye.